Gregor, I'll be brief, promise. <laughs> Good evening, everyone, and thank you for coming tonight. Welcome to the Serving Library, to Exhibition Research Lab, and to Liverpool John Moores University. Uh, that's the Matrioska place where we are at the moment. Um, tonight we're here for the very first of a series of 10 talks, 10, 10 events, that have been commissioned by Liverpool Biennial 2018 as part of its public program. And I would like to thank, first of all, Sally Talon, Director of Liverpool Biennial, Professor Yoja Kriza, who is not here tonight, Director of Ex Exhibition Research Lab, and um, Caroline Wilkinson, who is the Director of the John Lennon School of Art and Design, where we are. Um, right, so the talks program that we have been commissioned to curate uh, starts from the very question that is the title of the biennial, of course, um, which is, Beautiful World, Where Are You? And this is a quote from the philosopher and poet um, Friedrich Schiller. Um, and it's a, it's a poem that he wrote in the second half of the 18th century. And then it was later set to music by the Austrian composer Franz Schubert, around a few decades later. And at that time, um, that, was, that was a time of social turmoil and political changes and also scientific discoveries. And in a way, the curators of the Liverpool Biennial 2018, um, well, kind of saw that time as a mirror of our present times. So that's how we approach it. So of course, we're not asking the speakers to answer the question, but more to address it or to unpack it or to refract it in some way. And one of the kind of meta questions that we were asking ourselves while thinking about who to invite was what beauty are we talking about and what world are we talking about when we ask this question? And also are we looking back at the past, beautiful world, where, where are you, where have you gone? Or are we looking at the present or at the future, all of them together? So tonight, the first inaugural talk, we're thrilled to say it's by Candice Hopkins, an art historian and curator from Toronto, Canada. And um, she's going to take us on a journey. She's going to take us to Canada. And she's going to take us on a journey that starts at the end of the uh, 19th century, when the federal government of Canada puts a ban on the potlatch. The potlatch, for those of you who do not know, or like me, only knew of it as a gift-given ceremony, is actually uh, and a system of economy, and it is a system of governance, and it is um, a ceremonial tool to redistribute wealth. And it's practiced it's still today by citizens of First Nations, mainly based in the Northwest of uh, North America. Um, so at some point in the 1953, if I'm not mistaken, it was lifted. Um, but it's quite interesting to say, and we will hear obviously much more about this, that it's still the Indian Act that governs Canadian citizens and First Nations citizens. So that's quite interesting. Um, so the journey ends actually in 2017 with the masks of Bo Dick, an artist from Kawakawak citizenship. Okay, got that right. Very difficult. Um, that Candice brought to Documenta in Athens in 2017, which is also the year when he suddenly passed away. So if you know the work, it's only thanks to her. Um, so just to say a couple of words about uh, her career. So apart from being a co-curator for Documenta last year, she's also going to be co-curator of Site Santa Fe next year, and also of the Pavilion of Canada, which is going to present a collective that is of First Nations citizenship. Um, she has been uh, lecturing on also vernacular architecture and sound, and in general, native economies, which is also like, in a way, what we're talking about tonight. So we're really thrilled to have her here. Oh, and then one last note. She is herself of Karkros Tegish citizenship. So thank you again. Thank you for being here, Candice, and welcome. Okay, it's easier now. Okay.
I'm putting on this microphone for Michael right now. <laughs> um, thank you, Francesca, for the invitation, and Stuart, um, for the really lovely conversations we've had in preparing this. Um, also, thank you to Sally, who I met quite a number of years ago on a uh, round table in Madrid, in fact, on, called Biennials at the Periphery. Um, it's really lovely to be here in Liverpool. I've, it's my first time. My husband's very jealous uh, that I'm standing in this school that's named after John Lennon. <laughs> he told me to take some photos, so I will do that. Um, so as Francesca said, um, I'm going to be speaking about native economies, uh, from the potlatch band to the mass of Bodic. And I'm going to be doing this uh, in a few different ways. Um, so first, we'll uh, in fact start with some listening. We'll start with sound. Uh, and much of what I will say at the beginning concerns history. But as we know of history, History always also concerns the present. So let's begin with the song. does this sometimes it totally disappears <laughs> to bring it back you can see it there. oh you can see it there ah okay I can't see it there we go thank you okay this song um, because song is also integral to ceremony as, in, as is dance, as are the things of ceremony which are masks and regalia among many other items. This song was recorded by an ethnomusicologist named Ida Halprin. Ida Halprin moved to Canada um, in the early 1900s and when she immigrated to Canada, um, she was asked what she was going to do. And she said, well, I'm here to study the music of native people in Canada. And the response was, well, they don't make music. And I always thought that that was kind of a fascinating response. It's very telling of the kind of feelings of the day. And, um, and that was that there was a difference, a distinct difference between what was considered art, what was considered music, and who, in fact, performed those, those so-called high arts. But before I go into telling you more about the potlatch, first, we want to bring up the speaker's mask. Thanks, Sarah. <laughs> So this is Hayakinakkala, a speaking mask. Each namima or family group has a dedicated mask, and they're dedicated to speak the knowledge, and they're dedicated to speak this knowledge about family priv privileges. This includes stories, this includes governance, this includes marriages, this includes many, many things. And the open mouth is intended to enable oration. So I thought that it's only fitting to bring forward this mask first before I begin to tell you these stories. Umista and Nuambulis, their Kokwala words, their names bestowed on two 
new cultural centers in Alert Bay, British Columbia. And they were founded to house mass and dance regalia that was repatriated after the potlatch ban. Between 1885 and ending, some people say 1951, others say officially 1953. The word Nwambulis and Kukwala means stories from the beginning of the world. Umista is a term given when something returns to its place of origin. And in the past, people who came home after being taken captive in a raid, perhaps, were said to have umista. And although not originally used in this way, the masks and the regalia that have come back again to both Alert Bay and to Cape Mudge, they now also have umista. And while the objects at Nuambulis can once again tell their stories, those at Umista can also be witnessed. So in 1889, the German-American anthropologist Franz Boas interprets Alert Bay and also the Kukwakuak people as existing on Europe's outer edge. For him, they quite literally represented the conceptual and the geographic limit of European civilization. And he had to travel far to find it. In larger cities, he lamented that native people were already in European dress. And for, for him, these people were considered totally other, yet also the same. So what did Boaz do? He went further up island, and in his failed search for absolute difference, something that he would have to actively invent as well as discover, he, he had to make the case that, Kukwa, that the Kukwakiwak were not only at Europe's outer edge, but they were at the very boundary of Europe's knowledge as well. So this kind of limit played itself out in different ways, often through misunderstanding much of which at the time revolved around the potlatch. So in early European texts, these ceremonies, which traditionally have, each have their own name and their individual characteristics, their social functions, and they often only take place at certain times of the year. So while there are now primarily four potlatches that are practiced in Alert Bay um, to coincide with the different seasons, at one time there were as many as eight, and at one time, potlatches could last up to three months. So in these early texts, they called them medicine feasts. So the European authors understood that for native people, healing was an irreducible part of the communal sharing of food and also the collective distribution of wealth. And the first spelling, in fact, of potlatch, which was P-A-T-L-C-H, emerged first in quotations, as though the namers were unsure of the name, struggling with what to call what they were witnessing. And whether the communal sharing of wealth was simply a gift with no expectation of repayment, or an act of reciprocity was also a point of contention in these early texts. So if indeed based on reciprocity, it brought it uncomfortably close to so-called European practices, and thus the uncivilized comfortably close, uncomfortably close to that of civilized society. And this necessitated that, they, that those in power, in fact, busy themselves in generating even more distance between this custom and other European traditions. Another motive for the potlatch ban was that in the months leading up to the ceremony, and in some cases up to a year, People were so occupied with the important tasks of accumulating and making things to give away, as well as new masks and regalia, that they didn't take part in other work. So the labor generated by the potlatch ceremony was clearly not on par with the labor of working, say, in fishing canneries or in other industrial pursuits. But I think the biggest threat was the fact that potlatches set in motion a separate system of governance and social structure that the colonizers could not countenance. So a leader, sometimes called a chief, 
confers and gains rank in the ceremony through displays of wealth, as well as very complex social contracts between hosts and guests, as well as complex social contracts between surplus and debt and interest. So there was no room for these two forms of governance on the frontiers of colonialism. And as Christopher Bracken has said in a great book called The Potlatch Papers, the thing called the potlatch is the point where the logic of colonialism comes to crisis. So the ban came at the time of another anxiety, and this one was economic. 1884 marked the beginning of a recession in British Columbia, and condemning the displays of wealth as particularly wasteful, as well as competitive gift giving, for which the guest of a potlatch was then expected to respond later with an even greater display of wealth during the next ceremony, which essentially bankrupt the chiefs as well as the host community. However, even though they were temporarily bankrupted, they knew that those who were to host the next ceremony would repay them back with interest. And this social contract was also the reciprocal bond of ceremony. And in the early 1900s, the potlatch also changed because of the influx of paper money and coins. Native workers profited in industries including fishing canneries, and then they used this monetary wealth to purchase more things to give away, including blankets and furniture, even boats and other modern conveniences. The best I think that I heard of was in uh, Dan Kramner's Super Potlatch in uh, 1923. Um, they destroyed a pool table. So the Western economy thus then enabled the native one. And for Indian agents, those acting on behalf of the Canadian government to govern native communities, it indeed pushed it to new intolerable limits. So in 1921, during the week of Christmas, Dan and Emma Kramner hosted a five-day ceremony in Village Island to enable her family to repay the property that her husband had gifted when they were first married. And in the largest group arrest to take place during the ban, 45 people were arrested, 22 of them were jailed, and in place of being jailed, there was a plea deal that was set up by the defense that offered the surrender of masks and coppers and regalia and headdresses to the crown, along with the public renouncement of the potlatch. So as they were giving these things up, they also had to say that they were no longer going to practice this, that indeed they were you know, good uh, Christian followers of, of the faith and um, that they were, they, they were no longer going to participate. And this took place not only in this community, but in neighboring communities as well. And where these objects went then is they went into the personal collection of the Indian agents, they were sold to private collectors, including George Gustav Hay. So for any of you who've ever went to the National Museum of the American Indian, either their New York City branch or the New Museum in Washington, his collections formed the basis for those museums. And many of his Northwest Coast, his best examples of Northwest Coast art came from the sale that, uh, how he profited during this ban in 1921. Others, um, for example, went into the collection of very far afield, in fact. So up until 2013, on the corner of his writing desk, after he passed away, was a Kokwakiwak frontlet. It's a kind of headdress. And uh, this was owned by André Breton. And it came uh, also from this confiscation in 1921. When his daughter realized that they had been searching for this missing, final missing piece at Umista Cultural Center, she gave it back. So once the name was settled, attempts to stop the practice began in earnest. So for someone who many of you know, for Jacques Derrida, he says that 
To give a name is always like any birth certificate, to sublimate a singularity and to inform against it, to hand it over to the police. And this was also true of the potlatch. In 1884, amendments were made to Canada's Indian Act to officially ban it and to persecute those taking part or even seen as aiding in the ceremony. And these amendments consolidated the power, this is important, to persecute, to judge, and to act as jury to a single individual, the Indian agent. And the ban dictated that, and I quote, every Indian or other person who engages or assists in celebrating the Indian festival known as the potlatch, again in quotes, <laughs> or the Indian dance known as Tamanawas, is guilty of a misdemeanor and liable to imprisonment for a term of not more than six nor less than two months. And every Indian or persons who encourages an Indian to, give, to get up to such a festival shall be liable to the same punishment. So policy, as Fred Moten and Stefano Harney remind us, is directed towards the poor and towards the dispossessed. Policy amendments come about in response to the failure of control. So the potlatch, despite the repeated dictate and assumption that it would soon die out, and its subsequent renunciation by Native peoples under duress, in fact adopted new forms and it carried on. So one of the first people to try and get back the regalia and the objects, and these are understood in fact as beings, as, as active, animate beings, was Chief James Seward. So this is in 1967, and after his first conversations failed, he tried to buy them back for the same price that they were originally sold to museums. So these were sold to other museums in Canada, including the Royal, what is now the Royal Ontario Museum, to the Canadian Museum of Civilization and others. So what they told him though, in particular the Royal Ontario Museum, is that, they, that he couldn't, James Seward couldn't buy them back for the purchase price of the objects because now they were objects transformed. He had to pay for their care and their restoration during the years that they were in the museum's holdings. So of course he said no. So these are indeed objects transformed. Behind me you see a picture of how they're displayed at Mr. Cultural Center, predominantly not behind glass, and also importantly in the order in which they have a role within the ceremony. But these are objects transformed and they in fact carry the context of museums back to their homelands when they return to both Cape Mudge and to Alert Bay. And this becomes predicated in their display as well, in their use and in their care. So one of the conditions upon their return was that both Umista and Cape Mudge had to themselves build museums that also had the same standards as uh, Euro-Canadian museums, but they did something I think that was very smart. They decided that, sure, we can call these museums, you know, within our negotiations, we're going to build them, we're going to say that we're going to build them, we're going to say that they're going to adhere to your protocols, but for us, they're cultural centers. In a, and within UMISTA, I think one of the most defining features of the space is certainly the repatriated masks and regalia, but it's the fact that the very heart of the space is open. And it's open because that section of the cultural center is for dance. So the objects are organized, or the masks and beings are organized around the edges of the room on stands, not behind glass covers. And as I said before, the order in which they're displayed roughly corresponds with their role in a potlatch. And they oversee the proceedings like sentinels. However, Nuambuli's cultural center, which is in Cape Mudge, it's a little bit different. A lot of information is given about the familial heritage 
of each of the mass and the regalia, and this is prioritized, as well as the role of each of these people in the 1921 potlatch. So the people from Cape Mudge were the guests of the potlatch. The people at Alert Bay, at Umista, were the hosts. But I think for me, they still feel like they have something of a homesickness, because contained in their exile and their return is still a constant longing for their reuse in ceremony. So these are rather famous photos of the confiscated items from Alert Bay. And of these photos that were taken at the time that they were confiscated, this one is the one that circulates most. So masks as beings perform different roles in a potlatch. And of those pictured, some are chief's headdresses, particularly along the back. It would be your left. And others are not displayed, but instead are not worn, sorry, but they're displayed at the appropriate time as a sign of high rank. And the remainder are danced. In the center of the image are transformation masks. And these are made with elaborate pulley systems. For any of you who saw Bodek's masks, either in Athens or in Castle, you saw some of these on display. And here they're shown in a fixed position. They're open with their inner faces exposed. And mid-performance, their wearers switch between faces. And they switch between often representations of the supernatural and representations of the mere human. And they thus enact that thin line between the human world and the spirit world. The large mass shown in the lower left corner of the photograph is of Zanokwa, the wild woman of the woods. She's often carved with her mouth open and she's adorned with a long mess of black hair. She's a cannibal. She captures children in her cedar basket and eats them later. On the upper side, on, the, on, I, on either side of the upper ledge are carved skulls. Representations of life and death are integral to potlatch ceremonies, as these images make clear. And I believe that the, that the frontlet, it's small, it's in the center. You can see it has the ermine skin coming down, the white ermine on either side of it. That was the one that was temporarily housed on the corner of the writing desk of André Breton. So now for the buckwas mask. This is the wild man of the woods. And for this, while Sarah stands, we're going to listen to a Hamatsa song. With the So the, uh, the mass and the beings taken from Village Island and surrounding communities were gathered together like sinners in the Anglican Parish Hall in Alert Bay. They were arranged on white sheets by Indian agent William Halliday. And the mass in the photograph are presented as evidence of supposedly fugitive practices. The photographs exist because of the ban but they are another kind of evidence as well, that of the white obsession with the potlatch, 
When the masks were shipped from Village Island to Alert Bay and assembled in the church, they became commodities. Before they were dispersed, and this was very painful for community members because they were gathered on a boat, none of them were covered. These are only meant to be seen at very specific times and only in the ceremonial big house. Um, people cried because it was like their relatives were leaving and they were no longer being cared for. So before the objects were dispersed, viewers paid admission to view them on display in the parish hall. And they were treated, things, so then things that were treated with relative indifference in the 1860s, by the 1870s, they were the subject of a moral crusade. And now they become trafficable. They entered the holdings of museums via holiday, and they were sold to various individuals. And a small number remained in the personal collection of Indian agent Duncan Campbell Scott. And so while the potlatch was described in their texts, in the texts of Indian agents, as worthless, the mass themselves clearly were not. So taken from the hands of the rightful owners, they became commodities and later vessels for others to project their ideas of the supernatural, of the primitive, and of the surreal. And they began, in this way, to very actively stand in for the limits of European knowledge. Central to this image are two large masks. Spread out, they reveal more than three faces. There's two main ones on the outside and one human-like in the center. And these masks are of the Sisuetlu, which is the two-headed serpent. The two-headed serpent is always depicted with horns, and the creature turns those who cannot face their own fears into stone. And perhaps in line with its double-headed nature, it also bestows power and it also bestows wealth. In fact, fishermen in Alert Bay and other communities wear the crest today. And in many ways, to be represented by this crest is in fact to not only bestow a person with great power, but in fact you're trying to align yourself with the great power of the supernatural. So understanding that from a Kukwakiwak worldview, human beings are not the all-knowing and all-powerful, but in fact you are always subservient to the supernatural. That's why you're always trying to be in dialogue and in relation with the supernatural. And in fact when we were organizing Bo Dick's installation at Documenta 14, I asked him about the heights, you know, what height should all of these masks be that are on different stands? And he said, well, it's simple. You put the supernaturals the highest, you put those kind of human characters, shapeshifters as well, at our level, and you put those from the underworld at the bottom. And I thought that made a lot of sense. So Halliday is evidence of fugitive practices, including people as well as the objects he sought. And in this photograph, a chief holds two tlakwa, or coppers, both a whole copper and a partial piece. So tlakwa are cut for specific reasons, either as a deep act of shaming, or to demonstrate the high rank or high status of a person who is able to bestow a cut portion to his primary rival. So he's showing his rank in this photograph. So this was the largest copper in the collection. The name of this copper means true whale. However, to me, the design on the copper looks like a bird with a defined beak and ears. And the face of the copper is very well worn, making it hard to interpret. And it was well worn because it's incredibly old. So people on the northwest coast started working with copper well before the arrival of the first Russian traders. And it was said that this is a smooth-faced or a white man's copper and therefore has no worth. However, its history indicated that in 1922 the copper was indeed valued at $250, which in 
which conflicts with the supposed worthless value of the smooth face coppers. So on April 16, 1919, in Alert Bay, there was a man, and I'll try to pronounce his name, but I don't think there's any Kokwala speakers in the room, so hopefully it's not offensive. Um, Wawi Pikiksui, and he wrote a letter on behalf of the Namgis First Nation to petition the potlatch ban. And in it, he appealed to Western economic models as a way of explaining the value of a tlokwa. He said that each tribe has its own coppers, and each copper has its own value. In the old days, there was no money, and these coppers were a standard of value, but increased in value each time they changed hands. And when, when the white men came and we could earn wages and cash for our labor, we invested our savings in coppers and used them the same as a white man would do with a bank. And we would always expect more back than we put in. We are giving you a list of the coppers belonging to the Namgis tribe and their values. Other tribes have their own coppers. So you will see the great financial loss that would entail us if our custom is suppressed. So this is an object that's now doubly invested, both with cultural value and indeed economic one, in the Western sense. One of the, I think, most profound um, conceptual objects that Bodek contributed to Documento was one that many people overlooked, but we placed it at the front of the room. It was a copper ingot. So it was about this size, it's very heavy, and it was made with um, Canadian pennies that now no longer circulate as currency. So his idea, and he received permission from the Minister of Finance to do this, because you're not allowed to legally alter currency, was to thus use this ingot to make a new copper that had much more value than the pennies. So during the ban, potlatches went underground, where their outward character was disguised, and at times, there, there were goods that were given away at Christmas time as presents. While in the 1930s, communities began hosting deliberately disjointed ceremonies. Dances and speeches were held on separate days from the distribution of, of goods. At other times, they were modeled on the gifting of relatively banal European goods. Say, 1,500 sacks of flour in the image behind me, for example, between the two poles. So in place of the usual potlatch rituals that accompanied distribution, when giving a sack of flour, as shown here, the offerer simply said, here is some flour to help you over the hard winter. So Christian ideas of charity were added to the ceremony to dispel any concerns over questionable behavior. However, this was a calculated decision. Given that these native communities had notoriously resisted assimilation to Christianity, and the choice provided the guise of conversion, while at the same time transparently carrying out their own spiritual and governmental practices. And when 900 flat sacks of flour were given away in Fort Rupert in 1933, the police were told it was an act of Christian charity, simply. So given the number of sacks here, 1,500, this implies the great wealth of the person who purchased them, their deliberate display beforehand, all of the people gathered in front. The giving of flour was likely a means to repay a great debt owed to another family, possibly because of a recent marriage or a change in status, the giving of a new name. So in this sense, the potlatch reframed brought about another crisis in colonial logic. Indian agents were well aware that this was a potlatch, it was happening openly, yet their strict description of the ceremony in their documents could not account for the changes in form in this inherent creative resistance. So what they had worked so hard to name had once again evaded their definitions, and it sprung out of their shadows of language and law. So bring in the third. So this mask, 
Bakwa Walak Nuwaksawi, man eater at the north end of the world, is a Hamatsa mask. So much has been written about the Hamatsa ceremony, perhaps because it's a secret society and we're all attracted to secrets. Um, it was used particularly as evidence of the savagery, the so-called savagery of native people. It was also used as further justification for the criminalization of the potlatch. Originally held as part of Sateksa, or winter ceremonies, young, it's essentially a puberty ceremony, young men enacted their procession of the man-eating spirit, the man-eater at the north end of the world. And by doing so, they were able to rid themselves of this spirit, to show their dominance over it, to show the dominance of life over death. So the Hamatsa was central for Kakwakiwak to reiterate the power of the living relative to the dead. And at the same time, they participated in the theatrical consuming of the dead, and while doing this, did not succumb to death themselves, as well as to the wild forces of nature. Yet there was another form of reciprocity at work here as well, and that being between the human world and the supernatural world. And while spirits are sacrificed, to enable for the survival of human life. And here you see him in the center of his mouth is a skull, right? As part of the ceremony, the very offering of human life is sig signified through the simulated eating of flesh. And this is understood as necessary to enable the ongoing survival of, not of people in fact, but of the supernatural. So here is the mask and the full regalia. So of course, to people like Boaz, this was incredibly fascinating because he had found, finally, the outer limits of European knowledge. And he couldn't help but take it on himself. So here is Boaz modeling for a diorama that was first displayed as part of the World Exposition in Chicago. And he is indeed enacting a part of the Hamatsa ceremony. He is in fact emerging from the mouth of the man-eater at the north end of the world. Here he is modeling for other dioramas as well in increasingly uh, in, in increasing states of undress, let's say. <laughs> and finally here, one with nature. So this took place in 19, or sorry, 1893, when a group of Kokokiwak young men and their leaders were brought to Chicago as part of the World Columbian Exposition, sorry, not the World's Fair. And it was there that they performed the Hamatsa, or a version of it, of course, because they would never perform the real thing, over and over and over again as a kind of reiteration to an uninitiated audience. And thereby they set in motion a kind of cycle of repetition and reiteration of the ritual that carries through in some ways to the present. Although Boaz, I think, was very earnest in trying to suspend it in time through the, also his creation of, the, of dioramas. And he modeled for both the male and the female uh, figures within these dioramas, as well as the ones that are still contained in the Museum of Natural History in New York. So here, if you look closely, you'll see all of the faces of Boas, including him emerging from the mouth. So it's a kind of fascinating you know, moment of the true becoming of the other. So to come forward a bit more to the present, so the Kokokowak people make clear that dance is not only a celebration, although it is also a celebration. 
It's an integral part of the judicial system and indeed of their governance. And they declare that a strict law bids us to dance. So in 1975, when the first set of beings of mass of regalia were returned, people in Cape Mudge and Alert Bay celebrated with dances that were not also simply celebratory. So, as I explained before, part of the agreement for the objects to come home was that they had to be housed in a museum. And with this, they took it as an opportunity to rethink what a museum can be. What a museum can be for them, for the future, and how they might display their returned belongings in a way that also talks to their complicated past. So I want to hear from Chief Billy Asu. So he was the one who was the guest at that 1921 potlatch. And this is him singing for Ida Halperin. So at a time when it was illegal to dance, to produce mass, to take part in potlatches, to celebrate births, because you would also do that through a ceremony, to give people new names at that time, People would accumulate names, and you would have a different name in the winter than you would have in the summer, and then this shifted. Also, women gained status in the community the more times they married. A little different than today. Let's see if I can get it back. By way of closing, one of the ways I want to close, there's a couple of different ways, so bear with me. I want to sto tell you a story about this image. It's one that you've already seen. And it was a story that was shared with me by Chief Robert Joseph, who um, was able to attend the opening ceremonies also of Documenta 14 in Athens. And he said that this is his his writing, he says that in a bid to stamp out the Aboriginal people in our culture, the Canadian government enacted a law prohibiting the potlatch during the Atlikim dance. And this was during the Atlikim dance, which I took part in. I remember a confusing interruption. Someone announced the arrival of unexpected visitors, and then all at once, everyone scrambled from the big house and out into the night. And my memory fails me somewhat, for I was then a little boy. My next recollection is that we were assembled in the big house, still in full dress for the Atlakim, posing for photographs. I remember a policeman in uniform being there. No charges were laid, even though the anti-potlatch statute was still in full effect. My people were operating covertly to sustain their traditions, their values, and their beliefs, to which the mask is so integral. And when I showed him that I had this picture, and he's, he was really taken aback because he said, I'm in that photo. And he's the little boy, he's kind of under the arm of the person in front who's demonstrating a dance for the photographer. So it's quite, quite amazing to hear him tell of that. So finally, the final mask we want to bring out is this one, this is Zanokwa the wild woman of the woods. And this is, she's a little bit uh, smaller, in fact, than life-size here. Not my bunch. Uh, this 
mask was carved by Bodic. And despite the predictions, he carved it in 2012. Despite the predictions of authorities and policymakers that the potlatch would disappear, which at the height of the ban were continually repeated by policymakers and by the accused, and the accused did this as a way to placate the authorities, the potlatch never died. As a system, it has proven to be remarkably malleable. At times, it was split into two parts, strategically incorporating European goods and ideologies as a disguise, or going underground while at the same time remaining very much itself. Potlatch objects circulate now mainly in the form of masks. Some are carved specifically for the art market. Others circulate only as part of ceremony. Bodic is a maker of masks. Of Kukwakiwak descent, he lived and he worked in Alert Bay. He was born in Kinkum Inlet, went to school in South Vancouver, where he started a student revolt <laughs> in high school, which I think is very fitting, because he didn't want to wear, like many teenagers at the time, no one wanted to wear button-down shirts anymore. They wanted to wear t-shirts. So he successfully led that campaign then. So the frequent subject of Bodick's carvings, many of which are now in the homes of museums and collections, as well as in the homes of his friends, is Zanukwa, the cannibal woman. So in this context, the eating of the other is a stand-in for a kind of cultural consumption, and he was well aware of this critique. I think that's why he let it circulate in the world. So in 2012, he tried to short circuit this desire for the consumption of things from the Northwest Coast when he removed 40 Atlakim masks from the walls of his commercial gallery in Vancouver. And he took them back to Alert Bay, where they were ceremonially burned, each and every one of them, in front of a set of witnesses that included his commercial gallerists. He always had more than one because he would play them against each other other artists, his friends, the people who would normally attend um, potlatch ceremonies as well. And the burning of the, the, act, the masks is not simply an act of destruction. In fact, it sets in motion the creation of a new set of masks, and in doing that, a new set of people who learn how to make them. And after four, four times when they're danced, and that doesn't mean four years, it just means four times that this particular Atlakim ceremony is held, these other masks will also be set ablaze. So there's a story about a community of people who wanted to do something about Zanukwa, because she's always you know, lingering in the woods trying to eat children, <laughs> although she's often a bit sleepy and it's easy to confuse her, especially if you start singing the right songs to her. And so they managed to capture her and they killed her. The way that they killed her was, and to also ensure that, they didn't, that she did not come back to life, was to set a huge, to build a huge fire to gather all the trees that they could in the forest and the branches. And on this bonfire, they placed her body, and she's a giant. And they thought that for sure this would be the end to her, and they watched her as she turned black, her body scorched and, and charred. And at that very moment, when her body and her face turned black, and she transformed, in fact, into something else. She transformed into a swarm of mosquitoes. So the transformation and dispersion of Zanukwa is something like the potlatch itself. And so with that, I want to end with a final song. And this song is sung by Dan Cramner. So Dan Cramner, if you remember at the very beginning, I know I've given you a lot of names. He was the one who was the host of the potlatch in 1921, which was the largest arrest and ban to take place in Canadian history.
So thanks everyone for listening. Thanks for coming. Thank you, Sarah. <laughs>
And now it's also used in Native communities as that name, even though they all have their own specific names. Um, so they all take a different form, let's say. Uh, so in my community, where I'm from, in the Yukon, uh, we hold them now only one year after someone has passed away as a memorial ceremony to help alleviate uh, the grief, not in fact, uh, you could say, of the, of the person, like you could say the widower, if her husband died, but in fact her guests. So there's always this sort of like uh, dual reciprocity happening because if you alleviate the grief of the guests, they will be the ones who alleviate the, the grief of the host, right? Um, so that's one example, and they're much more modest than they used to be. So people gather, they bring things, uh, food, and, and, these, and they're very short now, like they might just be a couple of days, for example. People will tell stories that will bring out um, regalia, sometimes make new regalia. And I think that an interesting part of uh, a clinket uh, potlatch or memorial is that you know, small amounts of money are given, in fact. They're all gathered in an envelope, but the money is symbolic. It's symbolic, again, as a, as a kind of something that you can gift, and it's always small amounts, like two or five dollars even now. So it's never, that part has never increased, but it was a way of incorporating uh, Western economic systems. In Alert Bay, it's very, very different, um, because they, they, even though they, the ceremony was so persecuted, they, were, they never had to take down their ceremonial houses. So when you go into the ceremonial house in Alert Bay, everything is high theater and it's extraordinary. So the house posts, um, which you see, let's see, here. In the background, you see the house posts have wings. So at certain points in the ceremony, those wings actually flap, right? So everything is made uh, as a kind of high, you could say high theater. Um, and every potlatch is based on different dances. So people, there will be a lot of remarks that are given. People will come to the center. Different dances will take place. Other people participate in those if they, if they know it and it's appropriate. Um, and they're acts of celebration. Uh, and also to, uh, to honor someone's passing. So, the community in, in King Come Inlet, where Bo was born, and also in Alert Bay, because he was such an important figure, they're still preparing for his memorial potlatch. It was supposed to take place in May, but no one's ready yet. Yeah. Thank you. Okay, thank you for coming. Thanks for having me.